Welcome to the part eight of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU, and uh, the topic of this season of ICU Link is African linguistics. Today, we have uh, a talk, uh, a joint talk by Daisuke Shinagawa and Lutz Martin. Uh, before further ado, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Daisuke is Associate Professor at Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa, as known as ILCA, uh, housed in Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Since 2000, uh, Daisuke has been doing linguistic fieldwork on Bantu languages, especially those spoken around Mount Kilimanjaro, such as Ra, Shiha, Uru, and Rombo. So he has been going to Kilimanjaro for 22 years, I just realized it. Uh, so <laughs> that's great. And he not only describes undocumented uh, Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, but also investigates uh, the formal and structural correspondence within these languages. Yeah, and uh, the, <laughs> Dr. Lutz Martin is Professor of Linguistics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, as known as SOAS in London, United Kingdom. His research interests are in formal linguistic and linguistic series in various areas. Um, and he also works on uh, comparative historical linguistics, language variation, and also uh, issues about uh, language, society, and identity. Most of his work focuses on African languages of Eastern and Southern Africa, in particular Bandu languages such as Swahili, Bemba, or Herero. Uh, to, uh, for Daisuke, actually, I met uh, him in 2009 at the Bantu conference. Uh, so I was a, still a baby Bantu linguist at the time. <laughs> I was just uh, uh, <laughs> starting uh, uh, working on Bantu languages. So, uh, and since then, uh, we have been collaborating uh, uh, extensively. So it's uh, good to have you here. And uh, uh, Professor Martin or Lutz, uh, um, uh, we met at one of the ACL conference, uh, 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 one of the ACL conferences. We couldn't figure out which one, but like we, that was sure. <laughs> so, and since then, uh, our past encountered in uh, many different African conferences and also uh, through uh, linguistic work. So, without further ado, uh, uh, today's talk uh, is titled A Microparametric Approach to Typological Correlations of Focus Marking Strategies in Bantu Morphosyntax. It's good to have you uh, both here uh, at the IC Link. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sung Hoon, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Daisuke Shinagawa, and uh, uh, I'll give a talk about the micro variation of uh, morphosyntax variation of Bantu languages. I will just share the screen. Can you see the screen properly? Yes. Great, thank you very much. So uh, the title is as uh, introduced by Sun Hong, that a microparametric approach to typological correlations on focus marking strategies in Bantu morphosyntax. And uh, in this talk, uh, we are going to discuss type of, oops, um, so we're going to discuss typological correlation between focus strategies and other logically independent grammatical features uh, in the Bantu languages based on the database called Bantu Morphosyntactic Variation Database that compiles data from 140, 140 languages collected through a set of 142 parameters covering an entire range of Bantu morphosyntax. Uh, through examining the interparametric correlation, we will discuss how the focus marking strategies and other morphosyntactic features are intertwined and what kind of typological tendencies are observed from a cross band to perspective. Uh, as shown in the slide, uh, this talk has five sections and uh, we are planning to have a brief Q&A session uh, between the sections. Uh, in the first section, we will introduce the methodological background as well as widely accepted discussions related to focus marking strategies in the literature. In section two, we will present a geographical overview of uh, major focus marking strategies and discuss their distributional tendencies in section three, we will provide uh, observations on interparametric correlation between the parameters related to focus marking and those pertaining to relevant morphosyntactic operations, namely negation, 
object symmetry and uh, inversion constructions. Based on the observations and analysis, we will discuss background motivations and principles lying behind the attested covariation in section four. Finally, in section five, we will conclude by summarizing possible generalizations suggested by the study and remaining issues for further investigation. Uh, Lutz will uh, give a talk on the introduction, please Lutz. Uh, thank you, good, um, good, good evening, I should say everyone. Good morning here in London. Uh, it's great, great to see some familiar names um, in the audience as well. Um, uh, let me start by, by setting the scene, if you like, for the study. Um, so microvariation studies um, can be seen as an endeavor to overcome the limit of descriptive granularity and sample rep representativeness um, against, against wider typological studies. So in, in, in quite early work on that, on, on that if you like, uh, from 2011, Daniel writes that linguistic typology started as a study of genetically unrelated languages. However, as large scale sample typology prospered, the drawbacks of the method became obvious. There's emerging interest in intragenetic typology, so typology of languages which are closely related, an approach that solves methodological problems such as representativeness of the sample or cross-linguistic comparability, as well as some practical problems of work with large samples, including misinterpretation of unfamiliar phenomena and relying on second-hand data. Indeed, an expert in language family in a language family may effectively cover the diversity of the whole language group relying either on his own data or on structured comparable data from languages closely related to the one he or she works on. That might be a little bit optimistic, maybe the last bit. But in a sense, the, 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 the work we are doing is in that in, in that intragenetic typology spirit where the where the differences are much, you know, much smaller, if you like, but also much easier, easier to understand and to map. So so compared to like when people started with the shoulder parameter, which was really very, very wide, our, our parameters are much, much narrow. And on the right hand side, you will be familiar with that. You, we can see it's a map of the Bantu languages with the with the Guthrie zones from, from A, A in the Northwest to S in the South. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so within, so this was the, the if you like wider cross-linguistic background within Bantu, um, there have been um, a pro typological approaches to morphosyntactic variation. And in early, early work, Bastin and colleagues actually in, in 1983, um, they developed a, a classification of, um, of a range of Bantu languages uh, on grammatical features. So I'm just saying it's, it was based on 52 phonological and morphological parameters um, that were aimed for, for um, classifying, clarifying genetic classification that started um, on the assumption of, of genetic classification, which was based on the lexicon, um, and then extended that to, to morphological and grammatical um, features. Um, having said that, uh, even though it says it's a statistic grammatical, there is a lot of, lot of phonology and morphology in there as well. So on the left-hand side, you know, these are the classic Taburen maps. Um, so on the left-hand side, we see the, the Regel de Meinhof, Meinhof's law. That's, that's a nasal dissimulation, assimilation law. So it's really more on the phonological side. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have assimilation, vowel assimilation with the with the perfect or past suffix e, e de. Um, again, I mean this is this is more morphological, but there's still phonological effects on the morphology. So it's it's not really very, very syntactic, if you like. Um, and of course, it's it's only only 52, 52 features. Um, next slide, please. Brilliant. So this is this is um the the more more direct antecedent of our current project. This is work. Um, I did with, with Nancy Kula and, and Klach Latuala in 2007, um, where we have a, a, a paper in the Transactions of the Philological Society, of which I'm the editor now, so, so things in swings and roundabouts, really. Um, and there, we, you, know, you may be familiar with that, we used 19, I think, parameters, and then there's some A's and B's, that's what only counts to 14. Um, and then we had 10 Bantu languages, and we compared them, we, we were trying to essentially bring together a systematic study of what has been had been around in the literature. So people work in different languages, different phenomena, and we try to synthesize that and bring it together to get a better overall understanding of the variation, the morphosyntactic variation in in the in the language group. So we, you can see we have a, a lot of object marking because that's what was well attested at the time. Uh, we have relative clauses, we have locative inversion, partial agreement, 
We even have um, conjoint disjoint, which wasn't that well understood maybe at the time. So there's much more work coming after. Um, but the but the current database we are using sort of is based on a similar idea that is we have you know features which you know which are fairly surfacey. So it's not like V to I movement. It's it's really more more on the on the descriptive side. Um, and then we have values for that, and then calculate you know similarities or correlations based on those values. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that brings us to to the database we are working now. So this is the what we call Bantu morphosyntactic variation database or BMV um, that we were working on since the you know mid mid twenty tens as it were. So this you know this is uh, the result, the current result, if like from twenty eighteen. Um, so we have a database of 149 languages, so much bigger, if you like, than the early preliminary studies of ours, of course, but also of the one of the Bastian group, of the Taburin group. Um, and we use 142 fine-grained parameters covering, you know, more or less, if you like, an entire range of morphosyntactic components. And um, there's recent work we've done with Peter Edelstein was very influential and, and important for building the database, where we reflect a little bit on question of granularity and balance, like we've seen in the in the earlier quote, um, underlying underlying the database. So that should be coming out quite soon as well. Um, and the way that works. So this is now this. Sorry, but I ask you, can you just go back? I think. Ah, uh, thank you. Just briefly. So there's, uh, it's, it, you know, there is a database. So if you want to have access to it, actually, it's not publicly available. It's password protected, but we are happy to share the password. It's just because it's still a little bit on the in the in the beta version, if you like. But if you want to play around with it, you're you're very welcome to do so. Um, so we have, you know, we have parameters, and there's single parameter support for either just a particular value on the left left hand side. We can also have a single language report, and there's also a map function, which you see on the right. Uh, which plots different values on on the geographic space. Um, thank you. Now we can move on, please. Um, so this is just to illustrate that um, illustrate as an illustration of a sampler parameter we've chosen here, parameter um, seventy six, which is about multiple object marking. So the the question, the parametric question is: Is it possible to have more than one pre stem object marker? Um, and that again, you will be familiar with that with that refers to the morphological template of of the verb in Bantu, where we have subject marker, tense aspect marker, and then the the object marker, typically just before the stem, and then extensions to the right and the final vowel, final vowel. And then the question becomes: Can we have an object marker? If so, are there many? And if there are many, what is the order? So that's the three dimensions, if you like. And the values we have, we have not applicable. And there is no slot for object marking, and that's just the way we chose the values. We could we can discuss that a little bit more if you like. Whether whether there's other ways of doing it, um, and in in the sample we have there are three languages in our sample where there is no slot for object marking. Then we have thirty five languages where there's only one slot for object marking. So that's the biggest group of languages. Um, then we have eight languages where the answer is yes. Um, in most contexts. Um, and they must sorry, they must appear in a specific 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 order. So this is so that's that's multiple object marking. So um, so eight have have that value. F five have um, multiple object mark most context and the order is flexible. Um, Nineteen restrict multiple object marking to certain structural context and they must be in a specific order. And there aren't any languages in our sample where there's both a specific context and the order is free. So we can go through that in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. So this is the an A one. So this is this is I, I guess typically in the languages of the Northwest. So this is Basa in an A language, um, where there where there is pronominal object marking. But if you do that, it would be a pronoun. It can be a full pronoun, a, a weak pronoun, a clitic pronoun. But it follows the verbal stem. It's not a pre-verb object marker. So that's the distinction we draw here. Um, so everything which comes after the stem is is not covered here. So in that sense, so that's why the value is N A. Then for no. We have Swahili, but that's just one slot, so we can have um, as an object marker five, he bought it or he bought it for her or him. But example 3C shows, 3C shows um, that we can't have both object marker one and object marker five in the same verb, and the different order wouldn't make a difference. There's one morphological slot, and that's it. Um, then if we turn to the uh, languages with multiple object markers, so this is, this is uh, from Wunjo uh, Chaga, uh, this is oldish data now from from Brest and Moshe, but of course Dice has worked on that quite a bit as well. Um, but the example we have here, these are two object markers. It's in yellow highlighted here, the key and the m, mm, 
um, object marker class seven and one. So she, she, he, she is eating it for her, if you like. Um, and they are both fine. So we have, um, we have two object marking, but we can't reverse the order here. That order is quite fixed. And that, that seems true for the whole language. So whatever combination of object markers we have, they better be in a particular order. Um, then the flexible order, that's entering, that's, that's from Wa, so that's very close related, that's, that's from Daisuke's work. So we can see that the variation here really is even within close related language. It goes back to the point about the micro variation, really. Um, so here we have uh, two object marker, object marker class three and the first plural. Um, so sending it of class three to us. Um, and there we see that both orders, either three and then first plural or first plural and object marker three are possible. Um, without you know, apparent structural restrictions. The, the, the exact conditions, I think, are always interesting to look at. But the, in terms of the morphologic para morphosyntactic parameter we have here, that's a different case to the Bunji that we've just seen. Um, and then we have the, the specific structural context. What we mean by that is that the case for Bemba, for example, by and large, there's just one object marker slot. So we can't have two like in, in, in 6a. But there are restrictions in that either if both object markers are referred to animate, so essentially they're class class one, two, then we can have, can have two. Or if the first one is from any class and the other is first person singular me. And that's that's quite that's quite common. The first person singular object marker often is just the nasal, so that behaves differently also prosodically, maybe in many languages. Um, so there might be a reason as well. So the, the Bemba cases. Normally, just one, but two are possible, but only under fairly strict conditions. And if you know if the conditions are met, the order really has to be you know there has to be fixed. Um, and then the final one, we don't have examples, we don't have, don't have languages. So if there are these conditions, then then there is no language in our sample, but the order would then be free. Um, good. So these are the possible relations. Actually, on the left hand side, we see on the map also how it how it works out. So the majority of languages allow only one object marker slot and um, object symmetry is more frequently observed as a context dependent feature um, and context dependency of flexible order of object marker may not be compatible. So that's the descriptive generalization we can draw from that. And I could just add, so what we're going to do for the, for the rest of the talk, we then combine the different parameters and compare values across different parameters to see, to see you know, typological variation across you know, intra-corpus variation, if you like, in there. Um, good. Another background which is important because we are focused on information structure um, is, is the different aspects of information structure in, in, in which have been noted in Bantu languages. Um, so auxiliary focus is one of the elements which is relevant for us. Um, so this is, it goes back to you know, work in the 80s now from Hyman and Waters. Uh, while it is quite common in Bantu that the same grammatical auxiliary category can be expressed in two distinctive forms, namely focused and non-focused forms, certain grammatical categories tend to be expressed only through the focused forms. Um, and then Hyman and Waters and Hyman and subsequent work talk about inherently focused categories. And um, we have just now also there's work by Tom Guldeman and we use that later on to not party to inherent focus, but also to, to talk about grammaticalized focus or grammaticalized information structure. It's, it's something which is probably really interesting in Bantu as a family, which it has this intermediacy between structural grammatical function and information structure and then the the you know, almost like the join of that where they both seem to play a role so the example here these are well known example from higher where we have the the top three forms are the past the, the present future present object, and future where there's two verb forms one which which has uh, you know different tone marking on the verb you can see that on the com which is to tie um, but then if the if a, the focused uh, object follows in this case Carl, uh, name then there is what is called tonal reduction. So there's no tone on the, on the verb form here. Um, but the bottom three examples show that, um, that if we have the progressive subjunctive consecutive, their tonal reduction doesn't take place and we maintain the tone on the verb form. It might spread a little bit to the right um, as we see in the first two forms. Uh, but but, that's what, that, but what Hyman and Butters conclude from that is that these, these bottom three forms, the progressive subjunctive consecutive, are inherently focused tense aspect categories. So that's why we don't get the tonal reduction because they are in themselves focused. So, so this is interesting that we have a split, if you like, in the tense aspect paradigm between you know, the forms which can have two different forms and those which can only be, be 
only have the focused forms and which are then said to be inherently inherently focused and the one of the questions is how and why and why only these where people have done since 1984 been sort of steadily working on um and then next slide please and then one one of the you know, developments of that is tom gilderman's work in 2003 he looks in particular at the progressive and looks at isomorphism between focus and progressives, and then she asking the same question, and then you know coming coming up with a better analysis, if you like, of this inherently focused, and says, look, there is this parallel we have, and she observes that from a cross cross bond to point of view, strategies adopted to mark predicate focus are often also used to express progressive aspect. Um, so this isomorphism can be explained by positing a grammatization process from the former to the latter. So it's precisely this interaction and interplay between focus and, and grammatical structure. So, um, so the, the examples here, there's three of them and they're important in a sense because we are using exactly the same categories just now. So it's morphological focus marking FM, MFM. Um, <clears throat> in the first set of examples, then we have um, um, verb doubling, VD in the second set of examples and then conjunct disjunct from the third one, third one. So on the left-hand side of the table, we have predicate focus forms and the right-hand side progressives. So the, the, um, uh, the pre-initial or initial um, verb marker N from, you know, historically maybe related to popular knee comes out in Kitharaka as a focus marker in highlight yellow at the N and then higher the same form or the cognate form comes out as a progressive marker as, as knee. So can, you can really see the parallelism here. Similarly, the verb doubling, so in, in Bokushu, kuyenda na kuyenda, we are gehen ya schon, we do go, don't we, uh, don't you see? So this is a uh, predicate focus through verb doubling, uh, whereas in, in the example on the right-hand side from the same language, here it looks like the tree is falling right now, the verb doubling is not so much focus, but of course progressive, progressiveness, progressivity. Um, and then finally, this is, you know, these are also well established data now. Uh, Zulu, the ya yeah, <clears throat> is at least analyzed by Gildeman here as a predicate focus form um, and as a progressive marker in the example by ya, Fika, um, they are coming. And of course, there's lots of subsequent work actually, especially, especially in Guni and Zulu <clears throat> on the, on the conjunct disjunct progressive. So, so you know, people might revisit that, but the general point is well taken that we have this parallelism between these two construction types, the focus mark on the one end and then the progressive on the other. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and that is, yeah, that's another really important point is the conjunct disjoint. So this is, especially since 2017, there's an edited volume, you will be familiar with it by Yannick van der Waal and Larry Hyman on, on conjunct disjoint marking. Um, and there's an example here in on the top from Kirundi, where we have um, a, a disjoint form where the verb is final in the clause, so the, the jackal is running, where is running is the form, and it's marked with the ra uh, prefix as a disjoint marker. Um, and then we have on the right hand side the conjoint form where you can see the, the, the verb form is unmarked, if you like, so that's the conjoint form. <clears throat> and that requires the post-verbal element, so the in this case, in the adverb fast, um, and and so the the conjoint form cannot be clause final. So that's the typical hallmarks. And then in the in the introduction to the volume, uh, Yannick van der Waal has a little um, table, very similar in the sense to what we are doing. So this looks very much also like like sort of a parameter form. So on the left hand side are the parameters, on the right hand side are the values, and that in a, in a sense tries to establish. The prototypicality of conjunct disjoint forms in Bantu languages, um, and there's there's um, so the I just I don't go through everything, but the first uh, row is interesting. The conjunct form is the conjunct verb uh, uh, conjunct form always non-final, and that's true for all the languages in that sample here. So conjunct cannot be final. Disjoint may or may not. So that's more, more you know there's more variation, but conjunct that's very clear. Um, then the question is marked by a prefix or by a suffix. We have um, either prefix or both. Um, and if it's only the conjoint mark, you can see that correlates. So if it's a prefix, that's precisely the language is where we have that it's only the conjoint mark. If it's both, then, then either, either or both are, are marked. Um, and then the final uh, line 14 um, is their dedicate focus position. And we are hi we've highlighted it. So there's three possibilities, either there isn't, or yes, there is one at IEV is immediately after the verb. 
But then we've highlighted the final one, that's the Rwanda Rundi, just because either Rwanda Rundi or both of these languages in, in what we are talking about and what follows in our sample often behave differently to all the other languages that seem to be the outliers. And it's interesting that here also they are the outliers in terms of the, the, the dedicated focus position. So this is just an early flag, if you like, to keep that in mind for later. Um, good, and with that, I think um, I hand over to Daisuke for the geographical overview. Thank you. And yeah, so before going to the uh, next section, if there is any question, uh, we will welcome any question, brief question. But if there's nothing, I will uh, move on to the section two about the geographical overview of focus marking strategies. Uh, and yeah, so the first strategy, so we will uh, pick up mainly three MOTM and uh, valve doubling and CJDJ and syntactic position, we are, we are dealing with four uh, major focus marking strategies. And the first strategy is the morphological focus marking, as in the example seven from Chaga Moshi, the most typical form of uh, morphological focus marking is the one derived from a copula used in the craft construction as in 7a, which is further grammaticized to the extent that attaches to a predicate as a critic as illustrated in 7b. This type of morphological focus marking is typically observed in Northeastern languages, including E50 and E60 and interlaxing zone J languages. Uh, you can see the, uh, the geography in the, you know, the, 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 the bottom side, the small map on the left hand side. And on the other hand, uh, morphological focus marking is also attested in Northwestern languages, such as A50, A60, and A70 languages, as in uh, example eight from Bafia. So as a geographical tendency, morphological focus marking is said to be a structural feature frequently observed in the Northern languages. And the second strategy is the conjoint disjoint alternation, which has been one of the most studied topics in current Bantu typology. As we have already introduced, there is a quite diverse typological variation in CJ DJ, but the definitive feature is that CJ is not used close finally, while DJ is typically, but not necessarily used as a form of predicate focus. Typically, the distinction is structurally expressed as a combination of morphological and prosodic means as in nine in Bemba. However, the distinction can also be expressed solely by tone. Hyman 2017 explained some of the prosody based marking types are triggered by the loss of high tone associated with the augment or prefix of the following noun, which is segmentally dropped in the example 10. In terms of geographical distribution, CJDJ is exclusively split in south and eastern area, and it is also attested in northeastern intellectual languages. And more importantly, CJDJ and MFM are largely in complementary distribution. Based on the database, there are only three languages out of 25 languages with CJDJ distinction that also have an MFM. However, if we look at the source in detail, seemingly they do not have at least a typical morphological focus marking. Uh, for example, um, morphological focus marking in Kifuriru is part of copula, which may rather be regarded as part of cleft construction. And the same thing applies to South Ndebele uh, in the next uh, example, where the focus marking element Ngu, uh, which is attested, uh, attached to the subject noun, is clearly a grammaticalized copula. On the other hand, the case in Ha, is rather than rather seen rather seen as part of morphological operation of CJDJ distinction. So we regard that CJDJ and MFM are practically in complementary distribution, and that this is not a surprising fact because they are functionally overlapped in that both case in, in, in that both can play a role of assigning both term focus as well as verb focus. <coughs> On the other hand, verb doubling is the third uh, strategy, is uh, 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 the strategy which is basically pertaining to expressing the information structure status of the verb. 
Structurally, it is consisting of an infinitive verb preceding a finite predicate as in 11, and it can be used either as a predicate focus form or as a topicalized verb form. As for the distribution, it has been argued that uh, the verb doubling is in complementary distribution with CJDJ. Uh, for example, Morimoto 2017 points out that the verb doubling construction is attested in languages lacking CJDJ alternation, such as languages of zone A, B, F, H, and K, which are mostly Northern and Western languages. However, based on our database, there is considerable overlap between verb doubling and CJDJ, which means the two strategies do uh, coexist in the, uh, in the mobile syntactic system of a single language. This distribution may also be explained uh, from a functional point of view. Unlike the functional overview overlap between CJDG and the morphological focus marking, verb doubling can be functionally accommodated in the CJDG language when the functional co coverages are reasonably differentiated. Finally, syntactic positions are another major strategy of focus expression in Bantu. As is widely accepted, the immediately after the verb IAV position is the most typical syntactic position for a focus element, especially as a dedicated term focus position in the CJ construction. As shown in the slide, uh, through the sample size is quite limited, the tendency is largely confirmed in our database as well, because uh, there are 10 languages uh, where IAV is used for the dedicated focus marking positions. The fact that the IAB is the most typical position for a term forecast in Bantu is also confirmed by Gibson et al. 2017. In their typological investigation, they classified languages with morphological focus marking into two types. One is a language where morphological focus marking is used for term focus marking, and the other is a language where morphological marking is used for verb focus including marking of CJDJ distinction. Uh, in the former case, a considerable, considerable number of languages use close initial position for a term forecast. While in the latter case, the majority of the languages take IAV as a syntactic term forecast position, but there are few exceptions of languages with a different focus position. This will, this will be further discussed in the following sessions but for now, we would like to emphasize that generally saying that the IAV is the most typical syntactic position, especially for the languages with the CJ, DJ distinction. So the next part is the section three about the interparameter correlation, which will be again uh, reported by Woods. Yeah. Ah, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Daisuke. I realized that uh, I've, I've been a little bit slow. And I appreciate the, the, it's the gathering of speed. I can also try to be a bit faster, really, uh, because there's still quite a bit we want to do in four. But, but this is really interesting because this is now at the heart of our, our own work, where we looked at the, at the statistical correlation, numerical correlations <clears throat> between these different values. So we compare on the left hand side conjoint, disjoint, verb doubling, and morphological focus marks. So that's the three information structure focus related constructions we look at. Um, and then we compare that with the present absence of a negative particle uh, with object order and a particular object symmetry uh, with inversion constructions where we look both at locative inversion and patient inversions. Um, and what we're particularly keen on are the forms, oh, yes, sorry, this is the locative inversion Swahili, I, you know, I think you're familiar, but we have the, 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 the lion is sleeping in the, in the forest and then in the forest sleeps the lion. Um, that's the locative inversion, the patient inversion is John is reading in the book, and then you get literally the book reads John, but the meaning is that John is doing the reading, and and the link here to focus has been noted quite quite you know quite early on I think in the discussion of these constructions, um, they are both inversion constructions. It's interesting that they behave quite different in our samples. In earlier work I did with Yenike, we all glommed them together really and said, look, this is the topology of inversion constructions. Um, but here it shows that, and we come to that, it shows quite differently. But if you go back to the table, what is interesting is the highlight, the, the pink highlights, as it were, or reddish highlights, um, that's really very high values of correlation. 
and there's one blue one, which is a really low value of correlation. So what we find is that there's a significant correlation between negative particle and conjoint disjoint and also morphological focus marking um, between um, object asymmetry between the passive, um, that is the, the passive test and the, and the, and the object marking test, um, particularly with the verb doubling related to focus marking, and then a low correlation between word order asymmetry in object marking conjoint disjoint, and we have more to say about that in a moment. Um, the other thing in passing, which is interesting, is that the, if you look at the values for the passive and the object marking in the in the um, um, object symmetry, these values tend to be quite similar, you know, confirming an observation which people have done before that these really seem to be correlated in the way that the word order data are. So the object asymmetry with word order, there the figures are quite different, and that you know that's an interesting result in itself. And then briefly moving to the locative inversion, what is interesting that we don't find any particular correlation between locative inversion and any of our constructions, but we find really strong correlation between patient inversion and the, and the um, focus mark on the left-hand side. So a little bit more on that in the following slide. So this is um, the correlation, correlation pertaining to the conjoint disjoint. Um, so what we conclude from that is if a language shows the conjoint disjoint distinctions, negative particles tend not to be present. So there's a negative correlation, if you like. Um, if the language shows conjoint disjoint distinction, objects order symmetry is relatively restricted. So the languages typically tend to be asymmetric with object order, which is really interesting. We can come back to that. It's, it's not what, what we expected really when we started. So, so in a sense, this is a really interesting, if you like, the interesting interpretation of that would, would really be, be grammaticalized information structure, but, but we can come back to that in a moment. And then if a language shows conjoint disjoint distinction, patient inversion tends to be not allowed. And the patient inversion, that's true for all the, you know, both for, con for conjoint, and all three, conjoint disjoint, uh, the verb doubling and the morphological focus marking. So we'll see that just now. Um, then this is the, um, the correlation between, between conjoint disjoint and negative particle. So you can see negative particles tend not to be present in the vast majority of sample 15 of 16 languages with conjoint disjoint don't have negative particles. The only difference here is the only outlier is Matengo, which has both negative particles, conjoint disjoint. So as a general heuristic, this is really interesting because of course it makes us look, look at Matengo in particular now and see is there anything we can say about what is different in, in Matengu either with respect to conjoint disjoint or the negative particle different from the other languages which, which would explain the outlier function here. So if nothing else, this is a really nice way of, of formulating research questions. Um, then this is conjoint dis, if the language shows conjoint disjoint, then uh, patient inversion tends not to be allowed. So there we have again, 16 out of 17 languages are follow that. So they have conjoint disjoint, but no patient inversion. The only exception is Kirundi. And we noted that before we flagged that Kirundi is slightly different also in terms of the syntactic focus, uh, focus position in terms of word order. So there's something maybe we can, we can understand why, why that's the outlier here. Um, then if you look at co-variation pertaining to verb doubling, so if a language uses verb doubling only for focus marking, it also shows a high tendency of object marking symmetry. Um, and if a language uses verb doubling for focus marking, it highly tends to not allow patient inversion. Um, so in particular, we have more to say, you know, yeah, we can briefly look at the, of the object passivation. So six languages in the sample, all six of them have verb doubling used for focus and they don't have um, object passivization. So there's a very strong correlation based on a very small number of languages. That's true for, for all of what we're doing here. Um, and this is the uh, patient inversion. That's really interesting. All our 15 languages which have verb doubling, using it for focus, that's really important. Don't have patient inversion. If you briefly look up the table, um, verb doubling used for topic, there are eight languages using for topic, and there the correlation is not as, it's half-half almost, it's 0.571. So it's really interesting, it's not the construction as such, it's the use of the construction for this particular information structure, so that really gives us a real clue of where the interpretation or analysis of that would go. Mm. Um, then looking at correlation between morphological focus markings, so if a language lacks a morphological focus marker, negative particles tend to be exclusively avoided from main clause negation. And if a, if a language lacks, uh, sorry, if a language has a morphological focus marker, patient inversion tends highly not to be allowed. So this co confirms now what we have already seen. This trend is very, very strong. Um, so here are the data for the uh, negation. So we have 16 of the 20 languages 
um, have with uh, with absence of which lack more flow geometry, more, more focus marking, also lack the um, negative marker, um, and then there's um, four out of twenty examples where they're slightly different. This this links back to work with, which we've done with Dyscape, you know, since last year, maybe a bit longer. We look specifically at focus marking data using similar data across the database. Um, so a paper coming out actually on specific at that point, but Daisuke can say more about that in the in the next section. Um, and then, so that's the patient inversion. Just as briefly, again, 10 out of 11 languages have this correlation as expected by now. One example they accept is Nzadi, a B language in the Northwest. That again, it's worthwhile looking at whether we can you know, play around a little bit with, with the definitions and the particular data whether we can see why this is an outlier, but otherwise the correlation remains very, very strong. Um, um, and yes, that was me done. And now we can look a little bit more detail at this, at this yeah. three correlations we looked at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and uh, for the discussion part, I mean, yeah, uh, we'll pick up the three, uh, you know, uh, correlation between focus. Uh, the first one is focus and negation. The second one is focus and object symmetry. And the last one is uh, the relationship between focus and inversion constructions. Uh, we will start with the focus and negation. Uh, so the based on this uh, observation we saw in the last section, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are now going to discuss possible background principles that may explain the significant correlation found in the database. Uh, the first thing is about, as I said, the fact that non-morphological focus marking languages tend to avoid negative particles. As for this correlation, uh, we rather uh, argued in the current paper, which is uh, published in, the, in, in March, I think, uh, that uh, we argued uh, that the contraposition holds. That means a language with a negative particle tends to have a morphological focus marking as well. Uh, one of the reason is that in many cases, Verb external negation particles are themselves focal elements, or they provide focus to syntactically adjacent constraints. As shown in certain A, the form grammaticalized from the class 17 locative possessive, which is Brahmi, functions as a negation particle in Quasar, while the apparent cognate form Kuami is used as a contrastive focus marker in the neighboring language Bembe. This example typically illustrates that the negative particles can be developed from the focus marking element, suggesting that the existence of negation particle may entail the existence of a morphological focus marker. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, in CJDJ languages, negative particles tend not to develop and negation is achieved through verbal morphology instead, typically by a verbal prefix as shown in 14 uh, from Akua. This may be explained by the fact that the CJDJ contrast is usually neutralized in the context of negation. And in such cases, negation is more naturally expressed through the DJ form than the CJ form, as seen in Makua, where CJ form is not used often for main clause negation, and the regular negative form is a DJ form. The same tendency is attested in another CJDJ language, Makua, sorry, Makwe, which is a genetically closely related to Swahili. As shown in the table, negation in all tenses are actually expressed through disjoint forms. <clears throat> this kind of structural bias that the main clause negation tends to be expressed through a DJ or a focus marked verb form is well observed in many languages where a structural operation controlled by the principle of inherent focus comes into play. Then how can we interpret that tendency? One possible interpre interpretation comes from the historical and functional association between focus, focused negation and the pre-initial negation marker. Uh, the pre-initial negation marker is proclitic attached to the subject marker as the verb initial ha in 15a. As Gultman 1999 argues that pre-initial negatives can be seen as functionally motivated by pragmatically focused negation in contrast to post-initial negation, which is illustrated in 15b. 
not only in Swahili as illustrated in uh, 15, but most of the Bantu languages, including the system reconstructed in Port Bantu, have a bipartite distinction of negative constructions, where main clause negation is expressed through pre-initial negation, and uh, the subordinate clause negation is achieved through post-initial marker. This suggests that post-initial post -initial negation uh, is more associated with semantic negation in that pragmatic focus contrast is generally ineffect in ineffective. This linkage in turn explain why the negation in CJDJ languages is preferred to be expressed by the pre-initial negation. And as a result, uh, negative particles do not tend to be attested in such languages. Finally, this hypothesis also explains the apparent exception of the case in Matengo, uh, where Matengo does have a negative particle, the particle always stands in preferable position, uh, which is grouped into a cluster of pre-initial markers in Goodman's classification. So the case in Matengo can actually be dealt with in a similar way to other typical pre-initial language, pre-initial negation languages. And the second correlation, uh, which is about between focus and object symmetry, is that as we have seen, our database shows that in CJDJ languages, objects order symmetry in ditransitive constructions are relatively re restricted. This is clearly contrasted with the tentative generalization claimed by Tela and Ngoboka 2015 that if a Bantu language has a symmetric word order in double object constructions, then it has a tonal distinction between conjoint and disjoint verb forms. This hypothetical generalization, however, is based only on a small number of sample languages, namely Ha, Tswana, and Rwanda. Uh, and among them, Ha shows ambiguous features in focus marker uh, marking strategies, as we have seen in the previous sessions, while Swana is well known that it has a considerable degree of dialectal variability. Moreover, according to Van Val, 2017, uh, Kenya Rwanda shows similar syntactic characteristics with Rundi, where the dedicated syntactic position for term focus is close final not IAV as a typical syntactic focus position. So as you see in the table and in line 14, so only the Lundi and Rwanda show that the final position is actually dedicated for uh, the term focus. And uh, in, other, in no other languages, uh, the final position are used for the focus marking. So these factors may affect the apparent controversy between the Tela and Zongoboka's hypothesis and a general tendency that is confirmed in our database. Uh, we will discuss further about the ex exceptionality in Rundi in the next session. Uh, on the other hand, the general generalization is also challenged by the simple fact that the object symmetrical languages are not necessarily showing CJDJ contrast. For example, Lombo, which is not a CJDJ language, does allow a certain degree of object symmetry, as seen in 17a. Locative can precede the base object, thus both order are acceptable. On the other hand, instrumental cannot precede the base object as in 17b. This clearly shows that object symmetry can be affected by different factors, including valency, which means applied versus non-applied objects, or difference of semantic roles of arguments, namely, for example, beneficiary, locative instruments, and so on, or other semantic properties of noun phrase such as animacy. Uh, there is an interesting discussion on saliency versus valency by Gibson et al., uh, which is in the list of our reference of uh, handouts. Finally, we are going to look into a correlation between focus marking and inversion constructions. Uh, throughout the three major focus marking strategies, there is a consistent tendency that a language with such a formal means of marking focus does not allow the patient inversion constructions. As we have briefly mentioned and clearly shown in the table, um, Yes, there is a clear difference between locative inversion and patient 
inversion. While locative inversion does not show any significant correlation with the presence or absence of CJDJ distinction, as for patient inversion, there is a clear tendency that the languages with CJDJ highly tend to be incompatible with patient inversion, but not CJDJ languages show such a sharp distinction. This is stat statistically confirmed through the Fisher's statistically uh, Fisher's exact test, as in the three tables in the bottom. While there is no statistic significance is confirmed between CJDJ parameter, uh, which is P74, and the parameter relevant to locative marking, which is P122. On the other hand, the, there is a clear statistic significance is attested between CJDJ parameters and patient inversion parameters, which is P123. Also, the reverse relation seems to hold. Table eight shows that the languages that allow patient inversion tend to lack major formal means of focus marking. As for the two exceptions, uh, while well, we can imagine that the anxiety case can be affected by the analytic nature of the language, uh, but Kirundi seems to be a consistent exception, as we have seen. Setting aside the exception first, uh, what is shown as a general tendency here is that there is a statistically salient incompatibility, salient incompatibility between uh, patient inversion and major strategies of formal focus marking. And one of the natural consequences of this tendency is that patient inversion can be regarded as a positive strategy of term focus marking rather than a result of topic marking effects as it is often assumed in the literature. Uh, for those who are interested in the topic, please confer uh, Van Val 2022 for the latest discussion of the patient inversion as a positive focus marking. Before concluding the discussion, we briefly uh, mentioned the exceptionality shown in Kirundi. As we have already seen, IAD is a prominent position for focus marking in Bantu and Kirundi is exceptional in that it utilizes a close final position for syntactic focus marking. This in turn may be relevant to the exceptional behavior as a CJDJ languages, language in relation to other grammatical components as we have already seen. Then the question naturally arises, how and why the closed final position can be grammaticalized as a syntactic slot for focus? This may not be answered in a straightforward way, but we assume that a key to appropriately understand this issue is the concept grammaticalized information structure as proposed by Hyman 1999. This concept suggests that any focus marking position was originally motivated uh, by the need of expressing pragmatic saliency, but as the grammaticalization process goes, it can be fossilized and the pragmatic or semantic function can be bleached out through the grammaticalization process. In that sense, the preference of the close final position in Rundi may be seen as a further step forward from the IAV marking. One more thing to add about exceptionality in Rundi is a morphosyntactic flexibility on object marking. In many CJDJ languages, there is a systematic asymmetry between CJ and DJ in terms of the possibility of taking an object marker in the verb. Uh, generally speaking, while DJ tends to take an object marker with or without a post verbal who, uh, noun phrase, CJ has a restriction to take an OM. However, as illustrated in 18D, there seems no such structural constraint is imposed on the CJ form in Kirundi. This structural flexibility in turn may allow more freedom of the relative order of nominals whose syntactic relation is grammatically marked on the verb. So uh, based on these facts, we may assume that the exceptional behavior in that Lundi as a CJDJ language allows patient inversion can be considered by the exceptional structural flexibility suggested. For example, in the preference of closed final position for focus marking and morphosyntactic flexibility of objects marking on the verb that allows more flexible words order. 
So we will conclude uh, our talk. So let's we'll conclude that uh, talk, I think. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had, to, I had to unmute myself. Um, so, so what we want to draw from that, and you can see it's, it's in many ways work in progress. It raises a lot of really interesting questions. We have, we have some, some analysis, but there's also lots of stuff to be answered. But so what we, what we want to draw from that is there's, there's general topological tendencies and possible related factors. So for focus and negation, we notice that while, while both conjunct disjunct and morphological focus marking cover both predicate and term focus marking, and they are largely in complementary distribution, probably due to the overlap of the function coverage, they behave differently in negation marking. While MFM morphological focus marking shows strong preference with negative particles, conjoint distance tends to take verb internal pre-initial negation, which is functionally more deeply associated with pragmatic focus negation. Um, May I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm tempted. So what, what, you know, one thing which underli underlies a lot of what we're doing here is the question of what is the relation between, in this case, in, in this case, negation and focus marking, and in, in, quite in general, focus marking and focus related elements more widely. Um, and what we play with here is that there seems to be a functional relation in the, with the negation one, a functional relation between the focus marking and the negation marking. And that explains what's happening here. Whereas with the with the other ones we talk about, if you like, functional incompatibility, but but both the functional consistency and incompatibility probably needs a little bit more spelling out formally what that actually means. But but I think that's our intuitions here. So so the fo focus and object symmetry, there we find a clear correlation between between conjoint disjoint and object symmetry, um, um, which is sorry the correlation between which is. Uh, proposed by Selen Goboka, which admittedly was only based on three languages. That we don't find in BMB. Um, um, rather, uh, at least about word order, we find that object symmetry seems to be restricted in conjoint disjoint. And there's more in-depth investigation is needed of the different factors involved. But this is where, where we invoke this grammaticalized information structure, where effectively you would expect with the conjoint disjoint from conjoint, if you have a conjoint form and that identifies the IAB position as focus, you would expect free word order because things have to move there. Now, if the if the word order for double object is, is, is asymmetric, it looks like that that position has been further grammaticalized. So it's no longer actually information structure, but you need to talk about information structure to explain the patterns. Um, so that would be one avenue of going there. And then our clearest results at least quantitatively, um, are focus at inversion construction. So there's a clear tendency that the languages having specific formal strategies of focus marking do not tend to allow patient inversion constructions. Um, and, and we should add, um, um, but, but that's not at all the case for locative inversion. So this suggests the functional overlap between patient inversion and other focus marking strategies, which means that the patient inversion can be regarded as a positive syntactic means of term focus marking, unlike locative inversion, which does not show clear, which does not show clear topological significance with other focus marking strategies. And locative inversion, I think many people have argued, is really also more a topicalization strategy. This is about you know, setting scenes, background framing, that sort of thing. Um, there is focus involved as well, but not as strongly maybe as with the patient's inversion. But again, just as a final comment on that, that sort of presupposes that languages choose particular strategies for focus marking to the exclusion of others. Um, and that in itself, I mean, that's an interesting observation because it's not clear why they would do and how they would do it. Um, and you would also expect some leakage. So almost there's this really strong tendency we find here with the patient intervention and all the other, other constructions is almost surprising if you think that these are very dynamic, dynamic systems, which diachronically at least ought to be in flux a little bit more. So the, this is, I, I think these are really interesting finding and it would be nice both to formalize the analysis more, but also think of it in, in broader terms about the relation between, between information structure proper and then syntactic structures and, and morphological structures and the grammatization of information structure. Um, and yes, I think this is where we, where we are with this at the moment. Um, thank you for that. I think with that, we can conclude. There's a bunch of references there um, for if people want to follow up, but I think we are you know, happy to have questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great, uh, uh... Wow, <laughs> comprehensive talk. <laughs> uh, so anyone uh, who has a question, uh, Cedric? Yeah. 
Well, uh, thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Uh, quite dense, so I'm not sure I have, uh, I'm especially for a phonologist, I need time to assimilate what you said. But uh, I always have the feeling that uh, focus um, tends to be associated with um, enhancement in meaning that uh, sometimes you have um, uh, something that is syntactically moved uh, and you also have prosody and maybe something also uh, in addition to express clearly the fact that something is focalized. And uh, if I uh, read this uh, concluding remarks, I have the feeling that uh, it, there is more um, complementary distribution than I, what I would have expected. Do you think it's because uh, maybe you um, were not able to uh, consider fo um, prosody for the moment? Or do you think there is uh, my first feeling that uh, uh, there tends to be multiple strategies at the same time to focus on element is not true in fact? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um... Actually, yeah, so uh, uh, I feel the similar thing, I think. I mean, so maybe we, uh, uh, you know, uh, the reason why we can see the such kind of complementary distribution is that we are focusing on the major strategies, right? So there is a kind of the, uh, you know, complementary distribution between the major strategies. But if we focus on, or maybe if, if you like, if, if you have wider uh, scope uh, to, you know, uh, to look for the various different strategies of focus marking, then the relation is not very clear like this. But uh, if we base on this, you know, uh, database, uh, what we can see is that, you know, there is a clear, uh, you know, a distribution, contribute uh, complementary distribution, maybe, you know, uh, more clearer than what we expected, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Yoneda Sensei. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Maybe I should say something because you mentioned many times about Matengo. So, and also, especially the Matengo as an exception, and that uh, both uh, it has both a negative particle and uh, CJDJ alternation. But uh, I maybe I missed how you account, you explained about uh, the reason. But maybe I can say, uh, as I have written, uh, the Matengo CJDJ system is really not complete. It's, it's really not mm. perfect at all. So maybe uh, it, it has lost or it is losing the functional uh, focus function. So it's, it is becoming more like uh, a spectral function rather than focal function. So it, it might be uh, explain the why Matengo is, uh, has both. Mm. Mm. I, I'm not very sure because like, uh, although Mateng uh, CJG in Matengo is really incomplete, so I don't know why Matengo has this CJDJ, why Matengo keeps, need to keep the CJDJ system. But anyway, the, it is losing the focus uh, function. So yeah, it might mm -hmm. be, it can be the evidence or support your uh, hypothesis. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, you know, the Matengo is, as you said, that is a kind of bit exceptional <laughs> language, but it's very interesting because, you know, uh, as you said, that Matengo has also the, uh, you know, exceptionality in other components of grammar as well. Mm. So in that sense, it's very, you know, uh, the, the, the exceptionality may support our conclusion as well, or maybe our finding as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
actually have a clarification question. Just uh, in the uh, CJ DJ cases, if a language uh, was uh, expressing were expressing CJ DJ only using tonal means, uh, uh, was was it possible to include that in this type current typology? I was I was just it's just a clarification. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Without the morphological means, especially because some of the grammars might not report a tonal pattern uh, of the CJDJ, right? Just the morphological, the presence of the morpheme uh, for that. And I was just wondering whether. Probably. Uh, matter of classification, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. it's very hard. I mean, it's sometimes a bit uh, hard to distinguish between the what is called like metatony and CJDJ distinction by tone, right? So it's gonna be a bit uh, the matter of uh, classification, but uh, I guess, for example, if you include higher as, if you classify higher as a CJDJ language, that means higher is highly tone prosody based CJDJ language, I guess. I'm not so sure about, about yeah. I don't I think, yeah yes yeah. I think I think in general in part in part we depend on on good grammatical descriptions mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the of the data in the database come come from grammars or maybe specialized articles so some 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 is you know based on our own fieldwork if you like mm -hmm. um, but but for the conjoint disjoint I think we are in a reasonably good space because of the of the work by by Yannick and Larry with the book they edited, and right. in that context, I think they look quite closely about you know that there's typologies. Actually, that we have a paper in there where we where we also looked at different grammars. Um, so so I mean, there's always the risk that something is underreported, and particular and particular structures which are prosodic, prosodically marked. Um, which which don't don't get as reliably reported as where you have like you know big segmental morphology, um, so there there is a risk throughout this throughout the parameters. But the conjoint disjoint, I think, just because there's so much work being done over the last ten years, that maybe we're on slightly safer grounds. But I mean, having said that, there's like five hundred Bantu languages, and we know maybe we have good information for like fifty. Um, so so I think there's still still quite a bit of scope. Um, and the same, in a sense, it goes back to to Nobuko Sensei's question as well. That I mean, we're lucky to have to have Nobuko here in the audience, so we can actually speak to a particular language. But in a sense, for all the values we have, the you know, the strength of the argument relies very much on the particular judgment we make. Whether you know, is this a morphological focus marker, or is it a copula, or is it a term marker? Mm -hmm. And and it's. You know, it's. I mean, you know, we started out where we had this quote about the topology, and I think where, where there's a real problem of comparability, um, and I, you know, at the moment, like people like Martin Haspel might worry a lot about that. About you know, it, it's the it's the question of cross cross linguistic typological categories. So if you say future tense is the same, do you mean the same thing in Russian and in Zulu? Um, and and the answer is, oh my God! If you really think about it, it's really really hard because because I mean some people say there aren't these categories actually. You have to define them all language internally, um, and with us it's slightly easier because the languages are so similar. So so the chances are that people talk about the same things are higher, but it's not it's not that it's completely completely you know ruled out. I think in both you know in both cases the big cross linguistic typologies and ours, you have the same same problems. Uh, I asked this question uh, because I thought uh, it would be exciting if uh, there's a language that actually has the CJDJ distinction only on tone and you still find uh, this kind of uh, distribution of restrictions on, even though it's not morphologically uh, expressed. Uh, and that's why I wanted to have a clarification whether any of the language uh, uh, actually includes uh, just a, a tonal based distinction, because then it uh, actually uh, might show that this morphological generalization, maybe I phrased the <laughs> question a little bit uh, differently in the beginning, sorry about that, but uh, uh, then you can have this cross uh, module, like uh, basically the prosody module, uh, uh, somehow directly interacting with the other parts of the uh, other modules in the grammar uh, in 
uh, seeing this kind of uh, cross linguistic uh, tendency in terms of restrictions, what is possible and what is not possible for the focus monkey. Yeah. I agree that would be really nice. And actually, that we should be able to check. Uh, because we can just go through the list in the, the list of languages in the database and what people have said about them and go back to the topology in the in the Yannicke book mm -hmm. um, and then see yeah that that would be really interesting thing to start with whether they are in that if not then we would have to extend extend the database uh, but that's something we can we can do quite swiftly right, right. Um, and also just going back to, to Cedric to your point I think that's really interesting as well um, and it, it links back also to the granularity. There's always a question like how, you know, how, how fine grained a question you are asking with these parameters. And there isn't really a good answer either. It reminds me a little bit, people say that for, for diachronic linguistic reconstruction, that if you want to have neat, neat classifications, you don't look at recent history. So it's really hard to, to get a good linguistic grouping of the, even Germanic. But if you do Indo-European, that's much better. And in part because the data, you have you know, it's a poverty of data, which always helps you to see patterns more clearly. Or you know, the flip side would be, you know, if you if you have too much data, there's almost too, almost too much noise. But then the question, of course, becomes what it is that you're modeling. But I feel a little bit like what we are doing here because we're abstracting away quite a bit, like the language labels we have, of course, that's an abstraction. I mean, most it's based on a you know, small group of speakers, sometimes one. Um, and you know, there's lots of varieties in between, which we haven't captured. And then the categorical distinction between either either they, there is a conjoint disjunction, I think that there isn't. But again, going back to what Nobuko was saying, you know, Matengu there formally still is, but function is on the way out. So where, where is the cutoff point where we say it's really no longer a conjoint disjoint distinction? And because, because we categorize both in terms of the, the, of the, the grammatical categories we have and in terms of languages we use, that's maybe why we get such clear signals in some of, some of the cases. But of course, in many other correlations, it's very noisy as well. So, so in a sense, all the correlations we didn't talk about are the ones where there doesn't seem to be anything interesting happening. Um, so maybe if we, if, we had, you know, if we had less granular data, we would get more correlations even at, in, in those levels as well. Um, um, but it is also it's just, just, uh, just another point. Of it's, it really also, it's almost like what this, what this work sort of says is also we really need more and better descriptions. I think you can only do that if you if you are comfortable and confident that what we say about a particular language or variety is sort of grounded in in you know in good solid description and checked and double checked, um, because that's I'm, I'm I think we are in Bantu studies we are at a point where we can do this and we just done it so it's possible, because there is this long tradition of really good descriptive studies. But on the other hand, there is still lots of work to be done, and if you compare like our studies with like work on European languages, you can see that the level of description you have for like language like English or Swedish or Dutch or German or French, it's like, you know, there's re it's a very different ballgame, if you like. Do you have more questions? So let me add uh, one more. Oh, maybe Cedric first. <laughs> Guest first. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. So it's it's always weird to ask a question on um, another point when uh, so much uh, aspects have been uh, addressed in a talk. But uh, I was wondering, uh, do you have any idea on uh, the part augment uh, plays in these questions? Uh, it, I mean, it's it's a very good question, um, and it, it plays a role in many ways. But I don't think we have addressed it quite directly. So, so there is people say there is a historic link, maybe also with the augment and the conjoint disjoint. Um, there is a link also sometimes with the what what you know the, the Western bunch of the tone cases, um, which people have worked. And there's you know in, in Larry's introduction to the conjoint disjoint volume, he goes through that quite quite interesting detail to tease apart what's happening there. Um, so I think that that plays a role. I'm not sure whether there might be a link between augment definiteness marking or you know, specificity marking and, and that link to information structure with you know, topicality versus focus. 
Um, there is, you know, you know, as I said, you know, better than I do, I think. But but in Zulu, there is, you know, the, the, you don't get the augment in negative context. So this is also quite interesting. So there is a link, certainly, with polarity, and we know that polarity is linked with information structure. So, so that it, you know, there's that certainly plays in it. We haven't addressed it directly, but there is in the in the database there is a, that specific questions about augments, and whether you know just whether they're present or absent. Not so much about the function, I think, but that would be something we could factor in here and see whether we find anything anything interesting correlated with that. I, I you know. I mean, we haven't done that, and I, I hadn't thought of that. Um, but that's a really interesting trajectory as well, and just see what we find there. Um, uh, Daisuke, do you want to to add? Yeah, I mean, I, of course, I agree, and also, yeah, this is the you know, uh, uh, this is what uh, Michael typology is expected to work on, right? So, uh, as is, as we said, that you know, augment has uh, lots of different functions, right? And some of them are actually related to the you know focus marking, but others are not so much. But so uh, it is very important for us to look into the you know variation of functions, and also we need to. Yeah, uh, investigate the integration between the you know specific functions of all and other grammatical components. I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask another question? Uh, so it's related uh, to uh, Lutz's response to Yonida's uh, remark about the loss of function of CJTJ in Martin Patengo. Since you have this uh, interesting uh, correlation that you uh, actually presented, do you have some kind of uh, thoughts about the diachronic changes? Uh, it cannot be absolute, I know that, but uh, uh, that would happen if uh, CJDJ gradually loses its original function. Uh, can it be the case that some other types of focus marking might emerge uh, that uh, was not uh, present in the previous stage of the language. Like, do you have any comments about that? Yeah. Uh, really interesting question. I think it's something actually. We you know that would be a, a nice little other subsection which which we could work out. I, and again, we haven't done that because that's quite right because we established these correlations. And if you then say, well, the conjunct disjunct distinction, that condition is no longer there, that one that allows other things to happen. So with the inversion construction, what is interesting is that it's not just the conjunct disjunct, it's also the focus marking and the um, verb doubling. So there it seems like you would expect almost a, a more large scale restructuring of how, how you know, information structure is marked. Um, for the for the for, you know the uh, for the object symmetry. You know, I mean, the way the way we analyze it at the moment is almost saying that most conjunct disjunct systems are no longer fully, fully information structure. That would be the for me the most most plausible explanation of the absence of object symmetry with conjunct disjoint. Um, so that's already quite a bit of grammaticalized. So so there you it's already happened almost. So this is in a sense this almost looks like. That we would expect the the disappearance of the conjunct disjoint system much more like in the like in the Matengu case. Um, whereas what is you know I mean what is surprising is this is this high correlation. You would expect in a in an earlier grammaticalization cycle to have symmetric word order because it would allow you to move to the IAB position. Um, the alternative would be to say if if what in what we think about Kirundi Kinyarwanda as an innovation, and then be shifting the focus position from IAB to clause final. That would be another prediction, if you like, um, where, where maybe that's happening with the increased grammaticization of the loss of conjunct disjoint, the, the syntactic, you know, syntactic um, use of the IEV position as opposed to the information structure use. It would give you the information structure use the final position. So we would expect more languages to have final position. That might be one, one outcome of that. Um, and then with the negation, so there we say that that conjunct disjoint tends to take verbal pre-initial negation. So if that dis, if that is decision if that condition goes, you would expect maybe more negative particles actually arising. 
that might be another prediction. So we should be able actually to spell it out in a bit more detail because we are quite explicit about the correlations we have here and then what we would expect happens next. But we haven't done that yet. That's an, it's an interesting question. Mm -mm. Let's say your response made me think like uh, uh, the coexistence of two types of forms. So maybe people without even realizing uh, uh, some people when they switch the object, uh, like uh, have a freer order, uh, the listeners might still be still not really recognizing, oh, they're doing a different structure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just like it just arises and it can be just completely it, it cannot, it, it may not be in stages. Uh, that's what I tried to say. And uh, the reason why I said it is like, I think uh, at Simon Fraser University, Chong Hye Han did some kind of study and on Korean, and uh, they looked at a very complicated, like uh, some kind of intrigued, complex structure. And what they found was even between brothers or like of a same household, sometimes have different grammar uh, related mm. to that. But uh, you not know it in the regular, Korean, you you won't be able to distinguish that these two speakers were different, but like when it comes to this intricate, like a uh, very, uh, um, that requires a really fine tuned granular kind of uh, structure uh, with a particular, let's say, uh, I don't ex <laughs> exactly remember the uh, uh, sentences, but like, for example, you allow movement and one language, uh, one grammar does not allow the movement. And uh, these brothers are just using it. And one person says it's correct, acceptable. And the other one is saying unacceptable. And you only know that because you probed uh, that particular question, but otherwise you not even notice that these people are having a slightly different uh, grammar. And uh, these kind of like object, uh, uh, free, free ordering of the object might be something like that, right? Uh, some people, might not even notice that they are able to do it. And mm. uh, for them, it could be that the CJ distinction, uh, CJ DJ distinction might be a little bit more uh, uh, lost uh, in terms of functionality uh, if uh, the correlation is uh, at work and a very, like, it's, especially for Matengo, maybe it's testable that some people might uh, really allow actually <laughs> this uh, object. Uh, uh, like different order of the object because they are uh, in their grammar, the CJ DJ distinction is more uh, just uh, taking a different function and other people who have a more conservative uh, grammar uh, may not allow that. I don't know whether how it will pan out, but it seems like uh, that uh, study that I've uh, uh, read about the Korean might uh, uh, give you some testable ground about this. Uh, different changes that uh, diachronically might be happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, no, Bukuda, you want to come in on the on the Matango? Yeah, yeah, I thought, I, uh, yeah, since uh, I uh, mentioned uh, Matango, <laughs> I, I thought. <laughs> yeah, Matango doesn't, Matango doesn't allow the, the changing the order of uh, object. Right, right, right. At, uh, at the moment, but uh, what I'm saying is, uh, just in case, if there are some people who are really advanced in terms of the CJ, uh, DJ. this is hypothetical, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying this is uh, definitely the case, but if it's, uh, uh, if this presentation, uh, uh, if the correlation is really something that we will uh, see and uh, it's part of the grammar, uh, uh, that's basically what we ended up, uh, what we found uh, uh, through this micro variation studies, then if there are any languages that are losing CJ distinction, then certain part of the restrictions that uh, we saw here might uh, not might become loose or, or like might become permissible uh, uh, to those speakers that uh, have a weakened CJ DJ function mm. form. But it's maybe very difficult to find those speakers, right? Uh, or like uh, maybe people are still mixing those two systems, and if they learned in school, for example, or like this is correct, then many people will actually just use a particular structure over the others and they will not say the other structure is possible, even mm. if they use it. Mm. So I'm, I'm just putting a lot of things on your plate. So no, <laughs> yeah, no, these, no, these are very delicious plates. We will, we will eat them all. <laughs> They're very good. <laughs> but I mean, just, I mean, so yes, please. 
So no, I mean, yeah, so uh, it's very, uh, you know, uh, interesting. And also we can think about that issues uh, from different perspectives, right? So from in the, you know, uh, we can think about that uh, issue of systematic change within the language. And also we can think about that uh, change, uh, in, you know, uh, from the perspective of, for example, language contact, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting from the, you know, different mm -hmm. point of view, yeah. And these kind of changes can, I don't know how it is in morphosyntax really, but in phonological changes, it has been reported. It just happens like abruptly, uh, uh, like the people over a certain age speak in this way, people over under a certain age speak in this way. And it can just abruptly happen, these kind of changes. It's not always gradual that there's a, a coexistence of a, a group of speakers in the same generation speaking both ways or something like that. So. Uh, given that kind of uh, also reports from other fields uh, of linguistics, maybe we mm -hmm. might be able to think in terms of that. Yeah, uh, I think it would be would be very interesting on the with the object order. Uh, one language would be really nice to look at would be higher because the the higher descriptions from the seventies and eighties, I think, say it's symmetrical, whereas higher descriptions from the two thousand say it's asymmetrical. Um, and of course, that, that's Tanzania. So there's lots of influence from Swahili, which is asymmetrical. So that's a really interesting hypothesis to see whether influence from, from Swahili has meant that some higher speakers, younger or, or school age, have shifted from symmetrical to asymmetric. Because, I mean, that's another advantage of the microtopology because the structures map onto each other so easily. So it's all this intra, intra language group contact, which is very different from these big contact scenarios across families. Uh, which are easier to detect, but it's also more, more difficult to do almost where it's here. It's much easier to change exchange material. Um, but the other thing, I think, Singun, what you were saying about the the, um, the Korean study, I think that's really interesting because, in the, I mean, in a sense, it's, you know, in, it's syntactic reanalysis, which, which often people characterize in that way. You can't tell whether somebody has done the reanalysis um, until, until they do something novel. And then you know they must have done it, um, but also in my you know my my formal formal linguistics I do dynamic syntax a little bit, and that's precisely what we would be saying because our structures are much more loose, so you could have very different structures to come to the same result, and nobody would ever know. It's in ninety nine percent of the cases communication just goes fine. It's just like like you say there's there might be a specific context where I suddenly realize I can do something which other people can't quite easily do. Um, and so, and then the final comment is with, with these data, of course, like in many cases, the IAV position is the same as the clause final position. If you have one element only, you don't know whether you're focusing the AV or the final position, because there's just one. It's only when you have more that you realize that there's a difference. So it's very easy, if you like, to make, make that switch. Um, and the, the grammaticalized information structure we talked about, I think, like in asymmetric languages, typically the in fret, noun phrase closer to the verb is also the more more salient one, or maybe the more topical one. So you would get like animacy, benefactive, you know, the things which are more worthy to talk about. So in, in some sense, they sound more topical, but they are of course also the things which you are more likely to focus. So so if you know if you if you have a narrative, you tend to to talk about things which move about and which are agents rather than the background type things. So the grammaticization of, of that position, it sort of makes sense. And as long, if you put the, you know, the, the focus, you know, focus worthy element in that position, doesn't, doesn't matter whether you do it because you think it's a focus position or whether you think it's the, it's the hier hierarchically higher position, the noun phrase which should go there. So the grammaticalized version, it would come out the same thing. It's only once these diverge that you realize actually there is a difference, but the change is easy to make. And to tease that apart would be really, really interesting, of course. So uh, we can uh, continue our discussion, but uh, for the recording purpose, I will just uh, wrap up it uh, with uh, formal thanks uh, to the sponsors of this event. Uh, uh, let me thank the two organizers, uh, uh, Tomiyuki Yoshida and Yoko Mizda, and Assistant Paris Framing, Shigeto Kamano, and uh, Liaison IERS Institute Assistant, Michiru Suzuki, this event was supported by the shared budget of ICU Research Institute, IRS, and the Ling Lab at ICU. Uh, our final colloquium of this season will be next week, uh, 
uh, it will be one hour early than today because uh, we uh, both speakers come from South Africa uh, <laughs> instead of from UK. <laughs> so um, uh, Dr. William Bennett from Rhodes and uh, Dr. Christina Riedel from University of Free State will share the research. Uh, and yeah, the talks will be held from 5 p.m. Uh, Japan Standard Time. And other information, you will get it uh, by email or you can check our website. Uh, let's thank uh, uh, Lutz and Daisuke one more time uh, for their uh, great talk. Thank you so much. And those who want to ask more questions, please remain. Uh, we will stop the recording now. <laughs>